chapter 12. I'm going to preach a message tonight entitled, The, the Recipe That Grew the Church. The Recipe That Grew the Church. I uh, <clears throat> was on my way here tonight, and I crossed over into Michigan, and uh, I saw a sign that says, Pure Michigan, right? That's your slogan. And uh, boy, Pastor, it wasn't a half a mile before I, I saw Pure Michigan, and then I saw uh, a sign for alcohol. I saw a sign for uh, a, uh, a marijuana place, and I saw a sign for, um, what was the third one? It was the casino. Yeah. I said, boy, your church's got some work to do. Says the guy coming from Illinois, though, you know. But, boy, the, the recipe that grew the church, I don't know what's pure about Michigan anymore. I'm seeing stuff like that, but... Uh, the country itself is in need of the church, amen? The country itself is in need of a Savior, and the country, our country, in this day and age, we need Christ, we need the gospel. And we find in Acts chapter 12 a recipe that grew the church. Now, you think of recipe, I thought of recipes, and we're, we're right smack dab in the middle of Thanksgiving and Christmas. The best thing is to have the ovens cooking my favorite dessert, chewy chocolate chip cookies. Write that down in big letters in case you want to bring me some when we get to camp. It can't be just crumbly chocolate chip cookies. It's got to be chewy chocolate chip cookies. If you gave me a bowl of ice cream over here and chewy chocolate chip cookies over here, I would choose both. you got to put them together, right? And so write that down very big because that will help earn extra points when you get to camp, right? But I will, I probably will never, no, I can't say I'll never refuse chocolate chip cookies because back before I met Miss, my wife, Rebecca, there was this girl that would come to camp every week and would, and she, she, she brought me a plate of chocolate chip cookies every week, which was not good because she had uh, some other intentions uh, to bringing me those, not just to be a blessing. She wanted to get to know Brother Todd. But so I would tell him, she'd come and I'd tell my secretary, tell her I'm busy, okay? And she would sit in the front lobby at the camp and hold these things. And finally I got tired of waiting in my office for her to leave and I would climb out my window because I had to go do other things around camp. That was the only time I refused chocolate chip cookies. But uh, anyway, I, I've digressed already in this message, but the recipe that grew the church. That, that, those che chewy chocolate chip cookies have a recipe. I can't tell you half the things that are in them because I've never really made them myself, but I sure enjoy them. And, uh, you know, the world likes the product of Christian young people. I'm looking at a lot of great young people sitting up, uh, paying attention, and uh, they may be little, but they, you can tell their parents taught them well, be respectful in church. The world likes the product that the church puts out in they're young people, but they don't necessarily like the recipe that comes with it. Uh, oh, you, 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 want, you, you make your kids sit in church, you make them read their Bible, you don't allow them to go to the movies, you don't allow them, you deprive your kids. Well, they like our product, but they don't like the recipe that brought us the kind of young person that we see sitting in before us in church tonight. And uh, we're going to see some, some of this recipe that might not sit well with us as, as a church, but no doubt it's what grew the church, and we're going to find that out tonight in Acts chapter 12. Verse number 1. Now about that time, Herod, the king, stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. Herod, you could put our current administration too from time to time, has done some of the same things. If we find ourselves uh, hand in hand with the, with the world, we're, we're not hand in hand with Christ. You know, if we find that the world likes us, we're, we're not following Christ. And so for the, for the political administration to vex the church, we know that they were doing something right. Now we're talking about, we're going to find out, we're talking about Peter and John and, uh, and James, and uh, we're going to find out that uh, the persecution they faced uh, as we read on. And it says, and he, being Herod, killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Now, we read that, and we, and we kind of just glance over it and read over it. But think about this. 
If I were, if your pastor was to stand up here tomorrow, next week and say, Brother Todd will not be at camp next year because he got put in prison and they killed him and they cut his head off for preaching the gospel. Now it really, be, now it hits close to home. It's not just some, some guy in the Bible. This was, this is James. I mean, think about how it, how it shook the church. I told you about the young lady who, who, uh, who passed away by that accident, but so much more, how much would it devastate our church if one of our own was killed for the faith, was put to death, was martyred for the faith? We see this happening to James in verse number two. And because he, uh, verse number three, this is he, Herod, uh, saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. See, you see here, Herod sees that his popularity rating started going up. He sees that the people liked what he did by killing James. And he said, you know what? I'm going to take this to the next level. I'm going to go, go out there and find Peter. And I'm going to bring him into prison. And I'm going to put him to death. And the Jews are going to love me for this. And, he said, and, and so he was doing this to appease the people. Quite a politician here. He, anything to just get a vote. And when he had apprehended him, uh, Peter, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers. These were four groups of four soldiers. So 16 soldiers are watching uh, and keeping watch over Peter and intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. What was he going to do with them? Probably put him to death the same way he put James to death by sword. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but... Prayer was made without intercession of the church unto God for him. Can I just stop here and, and reiterate once again how important it is to pray for your missionaries? Yeah, good. To pray for your missionaries? Don't just think that, just don't try to get the guilt off by saying, oh, I'll put a few dollars in the offering plate and send them on their way. I think more often of our foreign missionaries this time of year than any other time. Here they are away from their families as we enjoy getting to spend time with our families during the holidays. They might be in a foreign country. They may be facing foreign dangers that we are unaware of or sickness or whatever the case may be. They're just homesick is a big thing for missionaries on foreign countries. And, they, and, and more than just putting a few dollars in the offering plate and praying for your missionary or, 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 and, and supporting them with your finances, I encourage you to take those missionary cards that are on the wall over there and the missionary uh, letters that are over there and pray for your missionaries. You don't know the help that that'll be, the intercession that'll be in just the time of need as it was when we, as we read about here with Peter. Verse number five. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made with without uh, uh, ceasing for the ch of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. We see Peter sleeping in the inner, inner prison. He's got a chain on this arm. He's got a chain on this arm. He's got a soldier on this side of him. He's got a soldier on this side of him. But one word I want to bring out in this verse was he was asleep. Okay? He was asleep. You can't tell me that he didn't know what had just happened to James. He wasn't ignorant to the fact that he was in prison because they were going to do the same thing to him that they did to James just the day before. And here he's asleep. I kind of sense that he kind of took his hands off the situation, knowing he could do nothing about it. He said, God, I'm going to give it over to you. I'm just going to rest. I mean, what would you be doing if you were moments away from death? I'd be pacing the floor. I'd be looking for any crack I could in the, in, in the prison wall. I would try to take matters into my own hands as best as I could. Uh, but that's not Peter. Here we find him asleep. He put his trust in God, his confidence in God in this time. And as he's sleeping there, he's sleeping in verse number seven. Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him and a light shone in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. I mean, just I mean, you got to think about this. If his chains fell off and hit the, the, the stone floor, you would have thought that that would have woke the prisoner or the prison guards, that that would have woke them up, but it didn't. 
God, it's a divine intervention, woke Peter up, kept the prison guards asleep. The, and, uh, and, and we read in verse 8, And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and, buy, and, and, uh, and, and bind up thy sandals. And so he did, and he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. So he gets his, his shoes on, he kept, puts his coat on, and he went out and followed him, and wist not what it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought uh, he saw a vision. Peter followed this divine direction led by the, by the Lord, by this angel. And when they had passed the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate uh, that led unto the city, which opened to them of its own accord. The angels installed the very first automatic door on a prison. It opened of its own accord. I mean, just think about that. It opened, and they walked through into uh, out of the courts of the prison. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And here Peter stands, just trying to understand what has just happened to him. He can't. Under, he is not sure if it was a dream, if it was a vision, if it really happened. And he's feeling himself, and he's understanding. Wow, I'm really on the outside of this prison. And uh, this is a miracle. He walks down the street and comes to uh, Mary's house. Mary, uh, at Mary's house at this present time, there was a group of people praying for him, praying for revival, praying for the persecuted Christians at that time. We see this in verse number 12. And Peter comes to the gate of the house, and as he yells in to see if anyone's there, there's a young girl named Rhoda there, and she hears the voice of Peter. She knows the voice of Peter. She's heard him preach before. She's heard him speak before. She knows it's him. And out of just pure excitement, she runs inside before opening the gate to tell everybody what, who, that Peter was outside. And she runs in and disrupts the prayer meeting and says, Peter's at the door, Peter's at the door. And these people, they're, they're praying for Peter to be released. They're praying for revival, but they don't believe it actually happened. And they said, please, they, they, they said, stop interrupting us, stop interrupting us. We, we, we're praying here. Can't you see this? And she insists, Peter is at the door. Now, while this is happening inside, I find it ironic Peter has just broke through the, pris the, the, the prisons, probably three or four different sets of gates. But yet he finds himself unable to get in. He got out of prison, but now, he's, now he can't find, find a way to get into this house. Uh, and I just find that, that funny that here he is stuck in another gate here. Uh, but yet he stands there and finally someone believes him. They come out and they see that Peter truly is there and they rejoice over the fact that he has been delivered from prison and that their prayers have been answered. And we see that. Uh, these people had a lack of spiritual insight. They doubted. Uh, they didn't believe that God was going to actually answer their prayers, but he did. And Peter tells them all that God had done for uh, how he had led them out of prison in verse number 17 and how God uh, opened the prison doors and, and gave deliverance there. But we see in verse number 24, let's jump down there. It says, but the word of, the, uh, of God grew and multiplied. God's word multiplied through this action, through this story that we see here. And I want to just bring out some truths and some applications for us from this story that we can look, we can take home with us tonight. Some have you know, first. I want to talk. I, I want to mention the, the part of what grew the church. What the recipe that grew the church was prayer. Was prayer. God's people earnestly seeking prayer, praying to God, intervening um, on behalf of the missionaries that were put in harm's way. They were praying for revival, and God grew the church because of prayer. Some have never seen God answer a big prayer request, had a big answer of prayer in their life, because they are afraid to get themselves into such a need, such a position of needing such an answer. We don't want to put ourselves out on the line. Boy, preacher, I'd start a bus route, but I'm afraid I'd fail at it, so I don't want to do that. Uh, I don't want to get myself in a position where I might fail. I'm afraid of failing. I, I, preacher, I might want to 
try out a Sunday school class, but I'm afraid I wouldn't be any good at it. In, no, it's not by might, not by power, but my, my spirit, saith the Lord. And if you're not willing to step out, and, and that's the kind of person God wants to use, is that person who realizes and feels that they can't do anything in their own, their own might, because we can't. But that would be willing to bathe what little effort they, they have in prayer and saying, God, I'm going to give it my best, but I know that any good thing, any, anything good that would come of me would, because, would be because of you, God, and, and, and bathe that request in prayer. So many of us, and I want to challenge you that, that with that this, year, this next year. Maybe there's something that seems feasibly, humanly impossible. But don't give up on that request. Maybe it's someone that you want to see saved this year. Maybe it's a lost loved one that you've, uh, that you've been praying for for years. Have you dedicated that to prayer? Have you given that to prayer? Have you prayed often for that? Have you lost hope with that, with that prayer request? Maybe it's something financially you need to see God do. Maybe it's, a health, uh, maybe it's something health-related. I don't know what it is in your life, but... Have you lost hope and stopped praying? God's going to stop. God's going to won't continue growing the church if we have a people that have lost their sense of prayer and their need and their urgency in prayer. They were astonished. Verse six, look at verse 16. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Here they are praying for something. But when God answered their prayer, they were shocked. They were, they were amazed. And let me say this, that we, I, I feel that as a Christian, we should never be surprised when God answers our prayers. But we should, in faith, expect God to answer our prayers. We can rejoice that he does, but these people were shocked that their prayers were actually answered. They didn't believe that Paul was, or Peter was actually at the gate. They thought, best case scenario, that it was his spirit, that it was his ghost, which, made, which makes us believe that they, re, they thought he was already dead. They thought there was no help. There was no answer to this prayer. Yet they kept praying, and when, it actually, when their prayers got answered, they were surprised that God was able to do that. Hey, we serve a mighty God, a big God, and if we don't have that kind of faith that goes along with our prayers, why should God answer our prayers? God saw fit to grow the church because there was a group dedicated to prayer, a group dedicated to prayer. We see also that uh, there could be no deliverance from prison if there wasn't a prisoner to be delivered. Okay, it sounds pretty shallow, but think about this. There, were, there could be no deliverance without a prisoner to deliver, and there would be no prisoner without someone willing to stand for their faith. If you really think that we, as a church, faced persecution last year because someone told us we couldn't go to church, Paul, Peter, Rhoda, Mary, all these people would have laughed at us. We didn't really face much persecution. No one was taking our heads off. No one was putting us into prison. There may have been some threats about some things of that nature. But I want you to see that, that the church grew through persecution. The church always will grow through persecution. We don't necessarily like that recipe, but that is how the church has always grown down through history, was through persecution. Prayer brought about a miracle. The Bible tells us the effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. We know that in verse 24, the gospel was not going to be stopped. and In fact, it, it, it grew. It multiplied through these circumstances that seemed like they would stop the gospel from spreading, that would stop the growth of the church, church but yet God, God's ways are not our ways. And when we think he's going to do something great when we're in control and everything's going well, that's just the time he's not going to do something. But when we're at our wit's end, when we had nowhere to turn, nowhere to look but up, nowhere to give God, well, when, when God does something great and there's nowhere to turn but to actually give God the glory for it, that's when God really wants to work in our life and in our church. You, you must understand, God allowed persecution to come to that church. God 
allowed James to be martyred. God allowed that to happen. He was in control. He saw the circumstances that were happening. God allowed Peter to be imprisoned. And God gave the victory over Herod eventually. Even though one preacher passed away and was martyred, God brought revenge on that wicked king by killing him in verse number 23. All the soldiers that were supposed to be guarding Peter were, were killed also, were sentenced to death. And God got the victory there, and, and God used that event to help stage. This was all set to... This was to set the stage to show a greater deliverance. It showed an answer to God's people praying. It, it allowed, and it allowed the gospel to spread. And you know, we always like to take this passage of scripture and focus on the victory and the deliverance that came through Peter being, being set free from prison. But the gospel always spreads during persecution. Peter's deliverance from prison would not have been as powerful without James being put to death in prison. And we thought that that was a tragedy, and it was, but it helped set the stage for God to grow the church even more. One, it's been said down through history that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And that is so true. We ought to be more concerned with the gospel spreading rather than our own comfort. I found myself sitting in church this morning, and here, this is just us in 2021. We have a digital thermometer on the wall over on the side, and I found myself cold in church this morning. I'm like, 66 degrees, who turned the temperature to 66? Can't we warm this up anymore? I'm thinking, I'm complaining about the temperature, well, I want it two degrees warmer, and here these people are sacrificing their lives for the sake of the gospel. Look how far we've come. Are we willing to put ourselves where James did in saying, hey, I'm willing to go to prison for Christ. I'm willing, whatever it takes for the gospel to spread, whatever it takes for God's church to grow, I am willing to put myself on the line for that. The recipe of the church growing was persecution. It involved imprisonment. It involved the prayers of God's people, and it involved passion to see Christ lifted up. We don't like persecution, but we need to understand the great benefit that comes from it. And the Bible tells us, this know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come. And I'm here to warn you tonight, if God tarries his coming, it's not going to get better, it's going to get worse. But our, the smile on our face should grow. The joy of the Lord should grow in our hearts regardless of the circumstances happening within the world, within our government, within with, with, whatever's happening without should not affect our joy as a Christian. Amen? Uh, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. We won't be ready for them if we are not walking close to our Savior. How deep is your spiritual walk with God? Do you, do you only feed off of, is your only spiritual sustenance the hour of preaching on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night? Is that all you're getting throughout the week? How about opening God's word and saying, God, I need something from your word today. I need something. I don't know what kind of battles I'm going to face today. I don't know what opposition I'm going to face but I want to set my, my, have my spirit right about it before it even comes. And realizing that any pers persecution that comes can and will result in the church growing, the spreading of the gospel happening. And even though it might disrupt my comfort, and, I, and, and, and maybe perhaps it might cause my harm or an early death, I want to be willing to do that. That's not the Christians we see today in 2021, unfortunately. We want it 72 degrees. We want it comfortable. We, don't want, we, we want the world to like us. We want our family to like us. We want the devil to love us and God to love us. But that's not going to happen. Right. We ought to come out from among them and be ye separate. The word of God grew and multiplied 
Why? Because there were some people out there that were passionate about Christ, that were willing to go to prison for, for their faith, that were willing to step up against administration of the day that was telling them they could not worship God, that they should not worship God. They were willing to face persecution with a smile on their face, with the peace of God in their heart saying, thank you God for, allow, for counting me worthy to suffer for you. If we're not willing to suffer, we're not going to know Christ as we should. And this fueled the fire allowing the gospel to grow. I don't know what times will, will, what will happen in, in, uh, in months to come or years to come. And uh, I'm not trying to be alarm you, but I'm just saying that we know that perilous times will come. Let's keep our eyes looking towards the Savior who's come and say, we wake up every morning saying, is this the day that you're going to come again, Lord? Help, help us to stay close to God, to grow deeper in our faith and our walk with God in this next year than we did this year. And I want to challenge you, as I, as, I, as I drove into your state, and I'm not just saying it's your state, but it's all across the country. All this, in, this, these billboards pushing uh, a wicked society. I want you to take that thought in your mind and then look at the empty chairs that are in here tonight and say, God, we have got a work to do. Uh, we, we've got, we got, a, we got a, 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 a town to reach for Christ. And may it, we never get set and so comfortable within the church that we're not willing to say, God, what are, I want you to stir my heart this next year. I want you to, I want you to, to grow my faith. If it causes, if, if, it, if it comes to some persecution or some, uh, someone uh, befriending me uh, or, or someone uh, being mad at me for the cause of Christ, so be it. But I want to do whatever it takes to grow the church, to grow the gospel, to spread that gospel. And I want to challenge you on a personal basis, wherever you go, whoever you come in contact with, that you would share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them, to have that boldness. You might not have a lot of time to, to share that with them, as, as circumstances may not allow, or time may not allow, but you can always take a gospel track and hand it to them. And, and show them and, and lead them with the gospel message and an invitation to church. How well have you been doing that this year in, in, in late? You know, it gets cold out and the winter's come and it's harder to get out and to knock doors and to go sawning. But people die just as much in the winter as they do in the summer. And that blood is either going to be on our hands or we're going to say, you know what, you know what, we told you, we warned you. We, we told you about Christ. You never know what kind of time we have left. And the, we like the recipe of chocolate chip cookies. We don't like, necessarily like all the ingredients in them, but we like the, the end result in it. Okay, And we may not like how the church grew, but in fact, this is how it did grow through persecution, through hard time, through dedicated Christians, through prayer. And may that be the recipe, may those be things that we are willing to follow in order to see this pew be filled with a, with a new family this next year, to see our coworkers sitting in this pew. Uh, I can see your neighbors sitting there. That's how you got to see it. That's how you got to have, it, it, we, let, not, let's not be so earthly minded and, 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 and just what can I consume? How, what am I going to get for Christmas? What am I going to do? How, we're so, we're so uh, distracted on this level that we're no good to God. We're, not earthly, we're so earthly minded, we're not any heavenly good. Before you leave tonight, decide how you're going to achieve this. By taking some tracks, by passing them out this week, by praying. Uh, say, God, give me a deeper prayer life this year. By willing to face adversity, to face persecution. Whether it's in your workplace, whether it's with your own family. We've had family within this last year that we're not on speaking terms anymore with everything that's happened. And the Bible tells us that that's going to happen. That father is going to be put against their, 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 their son and daughter against mother. And that's all going to happen. That's part of the, the end times. But let us, let us try to have a faith like Peter did like these faithful Christians that were, were, were praying for revival. And uh, 
may we stay faithful, occupying till he comes, doing our best to spread the gospel for Christ, realizing this is the recipe that God set forward in Acts when the church was started, and it's the same things that will help us see people saved in the last days as it was the first. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We thank you, Lord, for this challenge that was given to us. We thank you for people who have paved the way for us to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. For those that have sacrificed, who have given, who have been unashamed of you, Lord, and uh, someone brought the gospel to my life, and I'm so thankful for that person, for the people that threw down through history who have passed that wonderful gospel message down to me. And in the last time, in last days, Lord, I pray that we as a church, as an individual, would be more on fire for you, that we take every opportunity to witness for you, that we would share our faith, that we would uh, be willing to face persecution if it should come, Lord, and uh, help us to be mindful of your, your coming, Lord. It could be any day now, Lord. I pray that we'd be busy about things, about your business, being faithful to sharing the gospel with others, Lord. Thank you for the good testimony and the good um, example we see in Acts chapter 12. I pray, Lord, that you bless this invitation, Lord. Help stir hearts to do more for you in this next year than they did even in this year, Lord. We pray you please bless in this invitation as pastor comes in your name. Pray. Amen. Amen. That's a blessing, Brother Todd. Sure appreciate that message. What a practical, practical challenge from the Word of God. Wonderful text. Wonderful passage of scripture, very helpful and practical outline for us to follow. And uh, just uh, we, we understand the, the truth there. We don't, we don't uh, a lot of times like all the ingredients of the recipe, but it takes that recipe to, uh, to have the finished product. And I'll tell you, we do need to be praying so much more. And we need to be willing to face and willing to stand uh, for right even up to persecution. We still have it so good in this country. We really do, uh, compared to still brothers and sisters in Christ overseas and other places that are actually being killed for their faith in Christ as Savior. And it could come to a city near you. It could come to our country someday. If we keep going in the direction we're going, it is certainly, it's, it's highly possible uh, that the, the political uh, parties will, will find the popularity and the persecution of the saints, and it certainly could happen. Uh, we're not, uh, I'm not preaching woe is me, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be bleak or pessimistic, because I believe revival could also happen as well, and that's what I'm looking forward to, amen. But it's not going to happen if there ain't prayer and if they ain't willing to stand uh, for what is right. Would you please stand uh, with me, and, and I'm going to have uh, uh, somebody come and get, get to this piano here, and we'll, oh, she's already over there. Hey, Miss Holly, how are you doing today? I didn't see you slide over there. Thank you, uh, sis. We're going to go ahead and have a time of invitation. I don't know how God's worked in your heart, but, you know, it, it's just it's so true. We, we want to see growth. We want to be able to reach our community, but it's not going to happen uh, in, in comfort. It's not going to happen uh, if we just continue to be casual. It's going to happen when we pray and uh, when we are willing to stand for what's right, even up to uh, persecution, adding these ingredients together and seeing the Lord come out with a finished, uh, finished outcome. Amen. And uh, so I don't know how the Lord's worked on your heart today, but in this invitation, I just want to I just encourage you to just get some things settled with the Lord. Uh, make some commitments. Amen. It's such a wonderful opportunity for us to just surrender to the Lord. How He's worked on your heart on purpose today for exactly what you need. And uh, you yield in, in, that, uh, in that personal walk with him. With eyes closed and heads bowed as Miss Holly begins to play. How's God worked in your heart tonight? Did you come to an old-fashioned altar, get some things settled with him? If you're looking in in the live stream today, you just happen to tur turn uh, to our channel and you're looking on the live stream and you're watching the church service tonight and you've not yet trusted Jesus to be your Savior. I believe uh, everybody at the age of accountability in our church today has that I know of has made a decision to trust Christ as Savior. But if you're here, understand and don't know Jesus as Savior or you're out there over the internet looking in and have not yet trusted Jesus as Savior, the most important thing, most important uh, item uh, of, of spiritual business that could be ta taken care of would be that of you putting your faith and trust in Jesus as your personal Savior. The greatest thing that could be accomplished in the service today, I believe Brother Todd would agree 100% with this, is somebody getting born again that was lost when they came to service today or tuned in over the internet. And so I'd encourage you today, if the Holy Spirit of God has worked on your heart about your need for Jesus as Savior, that you let today be the day where you say yes to Jesus. I prayed a little prayer when I trusted Christ as Savior.
it wasn't the prayer that saved me. And, uh, but it was some simple words like, I know I'm a sinner, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Uh, I, I believe that you're the Savior. Would you please be my Savior? Something simple. I don't even know if it made all that kind of sense, honestly. But it wasn't the words that saved me. It was in my heart when, as I prayed and asked Jesus to be my Savior. It was my heart believing that as I called on him, he would be my Savior. I hope that today be the day where you put your faith and trust in him as Savior. And if you're saved today, those that are born again, I sure hope that we'd get busy. I sure hope that we'd really see these last times and these last days as the opportunity that they present and make sure that we're getting out there and growing uh, growing the church. We don't grow the church. Christ grows the church, but we bring the material in for him to grow that church. And, and we need to get out there and bring some material in. Make sure you have a pocket full of gospel tracts when you leave tonight. And uh, let us make sure that we're praying, praying uh, for our church, praying for the big things coming up. Amen. It's a blessing. Thanks, Miss Holly.